Good evening, early birds. We'll start in exactly 50 seconds. I went on a little early to make sure Facebook behaved. And it never behaves, but that's... So just because of that, I'm not behaving. Yeah. Venerable Jackie is here. Good evening. It's 7 o'clock here in the northeast of the United States. This is the Tibet Center. Our Tibetan name is Kunchab Tardu Ling, place pervaded by seekers of liberation. And this is our twice weekly presentation of the Buddha Dharma, specifically stages on the path to enlightenment, the Lamrim Chenmo of Lama Sankapa, from completed in 1402, but of course, very relevant. If you have any problems with this sound, the picture, etc., Text me or Mr. Smith immediately. If there's anyone for whom you want us to pray for, want everyone to pray for, put their names in the chat box or the comments section, whatever you want to call it, um, as soon as possible. Don't wait till the end. And again, I don't see all of the names. Um, so you'll just read them. This I may not read the, all the names out. That's what I'm saying. Okay, we have, of course, the same thing I say every week. We have a lot to do. So we'll get started right away. Prayer for the spread of the teachings throughout the length and breadth of the West. All these prayers, everything we say, is on the Tibet Center website, thetibetcenter.org, in the FAQ section, scroll down to prayers. This is a recording. By the force of the blessings of the non-fallacious three precious gems and of the truth of our pure selfless wishes, may the precious Buddhist teachings flourish and spread to the expanse of all areas throughout the length and breadth of the West for all the people living here together with their near ones who have engaged in the teachings and have faith and respect for them, may all conditions adverse to their practice of the pure Dharma be dispelled and an excellent collection of favorable conditions increase like the waxing moon. And especially for those who work on methods to accomplish the flourishing and spreading of the victorious one's teachings, which are the source of benefit and happiness, May they never be oppressed by masses of interference and adverse conditions, and may this spontaneously happen just as we have hoped and wished. The Heart Sutra. Thus have I heard once. The Blessed One was dwelling in the royal domain of the Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a big gathering of great monks and great bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi, which examines the Dharmas called Profound Illumination, and at the same time, Noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, looking at the profound practice of transcendent knowledge, saw the five skandhas and their natural emptiness. Then, through the inspiration of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to Avalokiteshvara, how should those noble ones learn who wish to follow the profound practice of transcendent knowledge? And Avalokiteshvara answered, Venerable Shariputra, whoever wishes to follow the profound practice of transcendent knowledge should look at it like this, seeing the five skandhas and their natural emptiness. Form is empty. Emptiness itself is form. Emptiness is not separate from form. Form is not separate from emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discriminating, awareness, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Thus, all the dharmas are empty and have no characteristics. They are unborn and unceasing. They are not, not impure or pure. They neither decrease nor increase. Therefore, since there is emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discriminating awareness, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no sensation. No objects of mind, no quality of sight, no quality of hearing, no quality of smelling, no quality of tasting, no quality of sensing, no quality of thought, no quality of mind consciousness. There are no nidanas from ignorance, old age, and death, nor they're wearing out. There is no suffering, no cause of suffering, no ending of suffering, and no path, no wisdom, no attainment, no non-attainment. Therefore, since there is no attainment, the bodhisattvas abide by means of transcendent knowledge. And since there is no obscurity of mind, they have no fear. They pass beyond, 
say, transcend falsely and pass beyond the bounds of sorrow. Excuse me. All the Buddhas who dwell in the past, present, and future by means of transcendent knowledge, fully and clearly awaken to unsurpassed, true, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of transcendent knowledge, the mantra of deep insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequaled mantra, the mantra which calms all suffering, should be known as truth, for there is no deception in transcendent knowledge. The mantra is proclaimed, Tayat Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha. O Shariputra, this is how a Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, should learn profound transcendent knowledge. Then the Blessed One arose from that Samadhi and praised the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Avalokiteshvara, saying, Good, good, O son of noble family, profound, transcendent knowledge should be practiced just as you have taught, and the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Shariputra and Avalokiteshvara, that whole gathering in the world with its gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, their hearts full of joy, praise the words of the Blessed One. Mm -hmm. Ah, I needed that. Refuge in Bodhisattva vow, which of course we recite three times. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Enthused by wisdom and compassion today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind for full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Enthused by wisdom and compassion today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind for full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Enthused by wisdom and compassion today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind for full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. May all the pains of living creatures ripen solely upon myself, and through the might of the Bodhisattva Sangha, may all beings experience happiness. May the teachings, which are the sole medicine for suffering and the origin of every joy, be materially supported and honored and abide for a very long time. I prostrate to Manjagosha, through whose kindness wholesome minds ensue, and I prostrate to my spiritual masters, through whose kindness I develop. As a cause for the quick Return of Rato Chungla Rinpoche to our field of perception. His Holiness wrote this prayer and recommends we say it whenever we get together, and we do. Prayer for the swift return. Exalted wisdom of all victors gathered in a drop soul refuge manifest in the form of the one wearing saffron robes, Guru Lozang Tubuang Dorje Chang. <clears throat> Please bear witness here today that our prayers may be fulfilled. We beseech the great torch of doctrine accomplishing from long ago the vast waves of aspirational prayers, Lord of speech of the Victor Lozang's teachings, spreading them to the ends of the earth by means of explanation and practice. Though holding the commitment, I will invite all beings to be my guests in unsurpassed great awakening, yet you have withdrawn the activities of the form body that serves the welfare of others. Is that worthy of the supreme among beings, the bodhisattvas? Though impossible for you till cyclic existences end to abandon your commitment to liberate all beings, we beseech the new son of Nirmanakaya to swiftly return from the realm of Dharmakaya, brought forth by Bodhicitta drawn by seven steeds. Having reached the far limits of scholarship, religious life, and goodness, please come swiftly as an unrivaled, supreme emanation, full holder of the sage's teachings and wish-fulfilling jewel, <clears throat> return as the glory of Lozang Tempeh, magnificent truth of the three precious jewels, Mahakala, Karmayama, and Sri Mata Devi, and the ocean of Dharma protectors, may you spontaneously fulfill our wish, the swift blossoming of the reincarnation's fresh moonlight face. So, <clears throat> a little treat. His Holiness, in this book called Wisdom of Forgiveness, the Victor Chan book, I think he has a couple of them, we thank Geshe Namdak for pointing this out. Those of you who don't know who he is, N-A-M-D-A-K, Geshe Namdak, wonderful teacher, a Westerner, he's Dutch. And I like him because he has a New York accent, even though he's not a New Yorker, because the New York accent is derived from the Dutch. Anyway, what is it like to understand emptiness for his holiness? Victor Chan, in this book, 
the wisdom of forgiveness. He spent a lot of time with His Holiness, tailing him around India, etc. Uh, this is His Holiness. Uh, relax. This is a nice, well-written piece, short, you know. So it's like a little entertainment to start the year off. We already started it off, but we'll start it off again. <laughs> He's visiting Vulture Peak, and Victor Chan picks. I'm going to do the whole chapter. It's not that long. Five Indian commandos formed a human shield around the Dalai Lama as he trudged, trudged up the steep trail leading to Vulture's Peak, one of the key pilgrimage sites for Buddhists. That's where the Heart Sutra was expounded. Three, these soldiers, members of an elite unit in the Indian Army, were dressed immaculately in black, long-sleeved cotton shirts, flowing headscarves, and crisply pressed pants. He was a... <laughs> Each had a second scarf tied around the lower part of his face so that only his eyes were visible. All carried automatic weapons. Two of them, specially trained sharpshooters, had precision rifles slung on their shoulders. Even without their weapons, the broad-shouldered men were impressive looking. Each stood over six feet tall and was obviously immensely fit. More soldiers in khakis and blue berets, berets trailed behind. Trailed behind. I have never seen the Dalai Lama so well protected in India. It was a rare event for the Tibetan teacher to be visiting this out-of-the-way pilgrimage site in Bihar, the poorest, most anarchic state in the country. The authorities were leaving nothing to chance. That's where Bodh Gaya is in that state. It's the poorest state in India. You been there? No, not yet. Yeah. The Dalai Lama climbed slowly but steadily, leaning with the liberation into a walking stick fashioned from a scrawny-looking branch. From time to time, he chatted briefly with his Indian escorts, but he mainly kept to himself. A quarter of the way up, he took off his maroon outer shawl and handed it to Bu Chung, his attendant, who folded it carefully into a square packet. At one point, the Dalai Lama walked a few steps off the path to look at a small meditation cave dunk into the side of the hill. A disciple of the Buddha had cloistered himself there in meditation two and a half millennia ago. Good old neighborhood. By the time we reached the top of Vulture's Peak, the Dalai Lama was sweating. He stopped, reached inside his monk's tunic, tunic pulled out a tissue, dabbing his forehead and face with it. Bowing slightly, Tenzin Takla, close at hand as always, held out a hand for the used wife, but the Dalai Lama put it back inside his tunic. Tenzin Takla is his secretary. The top of Vulture's Peak was a handkerchief-sized piece of flat ground hemmed in by rocky outcrops on three sides. On the fourth, a knife-edged ridge dropped sleepily down the val a valley. A U-shaped brick enclosure built to waist height dominated the flat area. Numerous offering candles had been placed on top of the enclosure's low walls. It's small, but they say a thousand monks but that were there at the Heart Sutra. These beings are only seen by those with high perception. So. After prostration, the Dalai Lama walked to the edge of the ridge and looked down into the flat valley of Rajgir, three hours' drive from Bodh Gaya. A lone red dirt road bisected the verdant farmland leading straight to the high mountains ringing the valley. The view was gorgeous. But the Dalai Lama didn't linger over it. His mind was on the prayers, the wisdom sutras explaining the concept of emptiness that he had come to recite. It was on this spot that two and a half thousand years ago the Buddha expounded the doctrine of emptiness, an idea that lies at the heart of Buddhist knowledge. In previous meetings with me, the Dalai Lama had explained at length the interrelated concepts of interdependence and emptiness. They are two sides of the same coin, two different ways to come to grips with the same idea. This is what he told me. The existence of anything, coffee mugs, feelings of jealousy, is totally dependent on a complex web of relationships. Because of this, if you think about it long enough, there is no logical way for these things to exist independently. Therefore, in the Dalai Lama's terminologies, they are said to be devoid of a life of their own. They have no inherent existence. In other words, they are empty. He had also told me that to fully appreciate these central con concepts, to transcend mere intellectual understanding, a rigorous spiritual practice involving long periods of meditation is indispensable. In another interview, I wanted to know how the Dalai Lama first encountered the concept of emptiness and how it had subsequently assumed such pivotal importance in his life. Why is it so important? 
Emptiness is not an easy thing to understand, the Dalai, told me, Dalai Lama told me. But once I developed some understanding, some direct insights, then I realized it is applicable to almost all experiences, all situations. We are in emptiness. So that's, it makes sense. He turned to Lakdor, your teacher. Lakdor, great, great teacher, also on YouTube. L-H-A-K-D-O-L. Don't waste your time. Go right to his videos. Wonderful. And very funny. He turned to Lakdor and spoke to him in Tibetan. Having gained more knowledge with growing age, the influence of emptiness on his life becomes more pronounced, Lakdor translated. I think around 20 years old, I had already, already developed a genuine interest in emptiness, the Dalai Lama continued, rocking backward and forward gently on the edge of his chair. I remember one incident. In 1954, I attended the National People's Conference, Congress in Beijing. There were some days without much engagement, so I asked to study emptiness with Ling Rinpoche, my senior tutor. This was one indication of my interest. The Dalai Lama fell silent. His rhythmic rocking stopped. He sat ramrod straight and stared into the distance. After a few moments, he scratched his chin and started to speak, again in Tibetan, to Lakdor, rubbing his right hand gently in a circular motion around his chest. Lakdar leaned far forward, his eyes fixated on the Tibetan leader as he translated. And Lakdar's translation says, It was in His Holiness' late 20s, in 1963. One day he was reading a Buddhist text. At one point he came across a line which says, I is merely designate, designated to the self of physical aggregates, mental and physical collection. As soon as he read that, he got a special kind of sensation, a strange experience. Lakdor's voice was a hoarse whisper. I had to strain to hear the words. This is unusual because beings at his level don't talk about their realizations, unless it can be helpful. So obviously felt it was a proper moment. How long did that ex uh, strange experience ask? I, uh, uh, last, rather, I asked. That feeling lasted, I think, a few weeks maybe, the Dalai Lama replied. He spoke to Lakdor some more. The furrows on his brow lightened. He peered down at the floor in front of him and gestured at, the, gestured at the carpet with a sweeping motion. There was a look of wonder on his face. During this time, Lakdor translated, whenever he saw people, things, carpet, for example, he would see them as carpet and people, but at the same time, he noticed that they have no essence. He had the distinct feeling that there is no I, not in the sense that I do not exist, but a certain feeling of no I as we understand it. That's very important. I go for refuge. That's legit. The way we think of I normally is separate. No. So he's, I'll read that line again. He had the distinct feeling that there is no I, not in the sense that, quote, I do not exist, but a certain feeling of no, quote, I as we understand it. Absence of solid reality, the Dalai Lama said emphatically. He raised both hands to chest level and clenched them into a tight fist. Do you have any visions, I asked tentatively, unsure of the wisdom of pursuing this line of questioning. I had just realized that the conversation had taken an unexpected turn. The Dalai Lama was telling me something very personal, something perhaps only a handful of people have ever heard. No, he answered. But there was this experience of no I, I said. Yes, he's holding his answer. The Dalai Lama, again, spoke directly to Lakdor. Physically, something like lightning surged through his heart. Lakdor translated, he experienced something like an electric shock. I had the uncomfortable sensation that I was eavesdropping. Spiritual realizations are intimate, personal experiences for a Buddhist, and this was the first time I had ever heard a serious practitioner talk about them. But I needed to confirm what I'd just heard. An electric shock going through your body I asked the Dalai Lama. Yes, he replied. He was watching me closely, his hands now clasped on his lap. I heard a soft click, a sound that seemed to come from far away. Then I realized my tape recorder had stopped. The tape was finished, the old days, tapes. I kept my eyes fixed on the Dalai Lama, not trusting my ability to fish a new tape from my day pack. I'd get a copy of the interview from Lakdor later. I guess Lakdor was taping. <laughs> in those few weeks, you saw objects as without essence, without substance, I asked. 
The Dalai Lama sat very straight in his chair, his face impassive. It occurred to me that he looked very much like a Buddha at that moment. Yeah. I couldn't help feeling awed by his presence. Now, Victor Chan is an ordinary layman, a journalist, interested in Tibetan Buddhism, a good writer. So it's like us peering at this thing. He brought us into this scene. Yes, if I thought about non-self, no I, he elaborated. His holiness speaks now. If I thought about non-self, no I, he elaborated. Then in that one moment, just like a picture, I think it's similar to watching TV or a movie. It is especially like watching a movie. One way to look at the movie, feeling something real going on in there, but at the same time, while your eyes looking there, your mind knows this is mere picture, acting. It's reality, but it's not the hard reality that we normal know, normally know. Like transparent things coming towards us, something like that. Like a mere picture, like acting, not real. So seeing same picture, one without understanding this is acting, another seeing but still feel this is acting. The Dalai Lama was telling me that his way of seeing had changed after the strange experience of 1963. He saw that things now appear to have two facets. One, solid, real, touchable, the kind of everyday things we encountered. A fridge, a refrigerator means anger, neighbors. This guy has a way of calculate, putting everything in one pot in a few words. Second, the underlying unreal nature of things. Things that are like a picture show. Their essence, nothing but flickering technicolor images, mirages rather, on a wide screen. Their existence, characterized by constant change and impermanence, depends on a web of relationships. All things, fridge, anger, neighbors, can be viewed in these two perspectives. Material things, mental things. The influence of the 1963 incident stayed with him, the Dalai Lama told me. As he continued with his practice and meditated on a daily basis, his spiritual insights came about with more frequency. Whenever the thought of self or I flashed across his mind, it was likely to be accompanied by a sensation of emptiness, of no I. Previously, the Dalai Lama said, unless I think seriously and continuously, at least for a few minutes, it was difficult to get that kind of feeling. Nowadays, as soon as I remember about emptiness, the picture becomes clearly different. Is this a stronger realization of emptiness, I asked? Yes, the Dalai Lama said. Then he promptly backtracked. Emptiness, I don't know. I had the feeling he wanted to be very careful about this. What's the importance in seeing the intangible in things? What has got that got to do with your life, I asked. The Dalai Lama spoke to Lakdor. Normally, we tend to see things in a solid, tangible way, Lakdor translated. Therefore, there is a tendency to grasp at things, to become attached to things. We cling to the idea of a separate self and separate things. We strive for new experiences, new acquisitions. Yet as soon as we possess them, the buzz is gone, and we look for something new. Yeah, This endless cycle of craving brings suffering. I think we can verify that part. Maybe not the empty, but we know that part. Oh, wow. <laughs> in His Holiness' case, Lactor is continuing, this grasping attitude does not arise. This is because the, quote, self wishes, desires, or Rolex watches are perceived ultimately by him as impermanent. The self, your wishes, your desires, your Rolex watch, your Lamborghini, we could add, whatever. Um, they perceive immediately that they're impermanent, changing, elusive, Empty, like mirages, they are not quite real. So why get all flustered about them, right? There is no way you can truly hang on to them. Therefore, there is no point to covet them. If we acquire an understanding of emptiness, craving, the source of our suffering, is lessened. The Dalai Lama lapsed into Tibetan again. Something had tickled his funny bone. He launched into one of his full-body laughing fits. Waggling his head from side, wagging his waggling, he was yes, waggling his head from side to side. His face was so crunched up with mirth that his eyes disappeared. I don't know. His Holiness says he's boasting, and he says this is called a fool trying to fool others. Lactor said with a big smile. I looked over the notes I jotted down. The interview was veering in a direction I had not expected. A new thought occurred to me, and I asked the Dalai Lama. 
Did you ever talk to anyone about your spiritual accomplishments? In the early 70s, he, applied, he replied, I told Ling Rinpoche, almost like a report, about my understanding of emptiness. Then he, he trailed off, turning to speak to Lakdor in Tibetan. Ling Rinpoche commented that very soon His Holiness will become a space yogi. <laughs> Lakdor translated, a space yogi, yogi is a practitioner who realized space like emptiness, someone who has achieved substantive, substantive enlightenment. Space-like emptiness, illusion-like emptiness, dream-like emptiness, space-like in equipoise, dream-like when you come out of the session and things are there, but they don't have the bite. They're like almost evanescent, as he described before. So he said, His Holiness, uh, in other words, Ling Rinpoche verified his experience. This is the predecessor to today's Ling Rinpoche. Ling Rinpoche. Did you get into that state, I asked, throwing caution to the wind? I don't know, the Dalai Lama said. I noticed that he seemed to be twiddling his thumbs, but after a second I realized that his hands, resting comfortably in his lap, were rhythmically clicking the beads of an imaginary rosary. He spoke to Lakdor again. All the time he's making progress, Lakdor translated. His Holiness is quite sure about one thing. If Ling Rinpoche was still alive today and His Holiness told him about his spiritual attainment, Ling Rinpoche would definitely be pleased. So Ling, that Ling Rinpoche passed away in 85, I believe. No, 83, 83. So reborn in 85, and now he's with us today. He is the overseer of this Tibet Center, the spiritual director. Nikki is the business director and spiritual director also. There is reason why His Holiness is explaining, is explaining all this to you, Lakdor said, unprompted. Normally, it is totally improper to talk about these things. That's right, that's right. Therefore, whenever I explain some of my experiences about compassion and my understanding of emptiness, I always make clear, the Dalai Lama said, he switched to Tibetan and spoke directly to Lakdor. His Holiness sometimes talks about spiritual development to inspire people, Lakdor translated, but he always concludes by saying, I'm not saying I'm a bodhisattva, I'm not saying I've realized emptiness. His Holiness also makes this point from his own experiences. He notices that one can always make progress. Therefore, he would tell his audience, in my own case, also, even if I am not a bodhisattva, have not cultivated bodhicitta, infinite altruism, but I'm like someone who can now see the top of the mountain. So he's being candidly, uh, what's the word? He's downplaying his achievements. The Dalai Lama interjected, not reached top, but now I get the feeling, oh, I can get there, he said, and pinched his nose. You can smell it, I suggested. The shadows were lengthening on the charming veranda outside the room. The Dalai Lama looked at his watch and said to me, Now, five more minutes. I had been with him for nearly two hours, but I felt a slight panic coming on. I still had a page and a half of questions to go. As I considered my next question, Lacto turned to look at me and said, There is always some danger about uh, t- danger talking about things like spiritual development. Danger? I was nonplussed. I was also surprised that Lakdor had offered up this caution on his own and in the presence of the Dalai Lama. It was his habit to remain silent unless he was called upon to translate. If you say you have realized emptiness, while in actual fact you have not attained that state, Lakdor explained, the danger is this, the Dalai Lama elaborated. Although I do not have that intention, on the basis of my statement, someone believes that I have attained some higher state. If he believes it out of faith, maybe all right. But if he believes it because of my statement, then I feel, he paused. Lakto completed the thought for the Dalai Lama. If his holiness feels it's okay, it is fine that he gets such an idea, then there is a risk. So there is some selfish motivation now, the Dalai Lama added. As I had been at, as I had been at other times, I was struck by how unflinchingly the Dalai Lama examines his motivation for every act. It is a conditioned response. It happens every time he opens his mouth or makes a decision. It's automatic to that point. He's worked on it. Lie, of course, with a lay person or monk, everyone lying is sin. Negative, the Dalai Lama continued, with heightened intensity. But I'm a monk, fully ordained. If I tell others that I have some deep experience of spiritual realization, knowing I have not that quality, that lie is one major lie. It is cause for disrobing. No longer monk. It's not like telling a minor lie. It's a very big special lie, Lakdor added. 
like sexual misconduct, killing human beings, stealing. Then this lie, the Dalai Lama said, four major ones, I said, they're no longer monk. Therefore, it's dangerous, the Dalai Lama concluded. Yeah, root downfall for a monk. Our interview was at an end. The Dalai Lama walked over and gave me a hug. After he left the room, I started to gather up the things I'd strewn all over the coffee table. Notebooks, sheaves of typed questions, photocopies of articles, tape recorder. Lakdor hung around and helped me cram them into my day pack. We didn't make small talk as we usually did after a session. I felt drained, and he seemed to be as he seemed to be as well. As we walked out of the audience room, Lakdor gently touched my elbow. I turned to look at him. His face seemed soft, a touch vulnerable. You know, Victor, he said to me quietly, I've heard His Holiness touch on these subjects briefly before, but I've never heard him go into such detail, such depth. The monks said, the monks and lamas in the monasteries wouldn't believe their ears if they heard that interview. His eyes sought out mine. They'd be so inspired, so moved, they'd go crazy. <laughs> I hope not. Anyway, so we've been able to eavesdrop on this thing, thanks to Victor Chan. Uh, in this same book, he has the Dalai Lama encounters Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey act, asking about emptiness, and a Korean uh, monk asking about emptiness, a, a Confucian-style monk. It's interesting. Well worth it. And there's other little vignettes uh, that Victor Chan has. So I thought you'd like that. I hope you did. If you're not, you know, your money back in 30 days. Yeah. A little bit about Bodhicitta before we jump. There's like a, a page worth from Lok Sang Lolangpas. Bodhicitta is not just an idea. It's a way of being. And that's the point he's trying to make here. In Tibetan Buddhism, the doctors, there's a pulse for a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva will have a Tantrum Sempa pulse. They, I was told. I'm not a Tibetan doctor. I don't know much about it, but I was told that. If that's the case, it's a, a mental and physical accomplishment. There's a different way of being, I guess, uncontrived bodhicitta. I don't think the one where you make an effort for it. We all do that. But I don't know. But anyway, let's see what he has to say. When we speak of, this is from page Roman numeral 13 of Los Angla Lungpas, Life of Milarepa, the old one. The new one is out. It's the same book. It costs you 30 bucks. This costs five bucks. So, But that was 40 years ago. <laughs> what can I tell you? When we speak of the attachment, attainment of bodhicitta, we are speaking in terms of a process that can, can take place in any human being who is deeply dissatisfied with the life he or she sees within and around him or her, and in whom there appears a quality of wishing that is mysteriously different from everything in him or her that goes under the name of desire, need, preference, or attack, attraction. It's something different than those. A quality of wishing, different from need, desire, preference, or attached attraction. This fundamental aspect of the teaching of Mahayana Buddhism is conventionally translated into Western languages as the transformation of egoistic desire, egoistic desire into the desire for the liberation of all sentient beings. But it's not always realized that what is at issue is the activation and awareness of a completely new energy within the mind. So egotistic desire or egoistic desire doesn't cut it. It's an activation and awareness of a completely new energy within the mind. It is quite misleading to take the awakening of bodhicitta solely as a change in the object of desire. Remember, desire is an affliction. Afflicted desire is an affliction. Bodhicitta is not altruism as, it, altruism as it is ordinarily understood, although they use that word. It would be perhaps less misleading to modern people to symbolize the dawning of bodhicitta in terms of the, of the vibration within the psyche of a higher center of emotional intelligence. In order to understand this expression, it is necessary to ask what Milarepa means by the term meditation. And it is also useful to have a clearer picture of the meaning of what is called in the Buddhist tradition the Triple Refuge. Only by treating all these together can we begin to grasp the extraordinary interrelationship between the necessity of an external teacher, a spiritual community, and a systematic body of ideas, the doctrine or the, the Dharma, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the overriding emphasis in Buddhism on the individual's own inner striving and the demand that one 
relies strictly on oneself. The stark realization of his own inadequacies had brought Miller Repa to Lama Marpa. After completing the heart-melting ordeals which Marpa imposed on him, Miller Repa now begins to encounter yet another series of ordeals, namely the rigors of training in meditation. He begins his training by accepting the Triple Refuge, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. The Buddha, the Enlightened One, is the Supreme Guide, Dharma, the Sacred Doctrine, or Law. He, I don't like that word, but he uses law. So, is the means of gaining one's own enlightenment. And the Sangha, the Assembly of Awakened Adepts, maintains the tradition and supports the search of all who come to the path. But the Vajrayana tradition, the Tantra tradition, speaks of another form of the Triple Refuge. The Lama is the root of spiritual influences. The Yidam, the personal meditation deity, represents the root of one's own understanding and the realization. The Dakinis represent the forces within oneself in the universe which come to the seeker's aid once he or she has in rightly initiated his or her struggle for liberation. The true meaning of going for, to the Triple ref, re, Refuge for protection can be realized only if the seeker is meaningfully, meaningfully committed, not so much to formal acts of veneration as to a relentless striving toward realizing with his or own, her own nature the qualities represented by the Triple Refuge, the internal part. Buddha said, O mendicant monks, you alone are the refuge unto yourself. Who else could be such a refuge? So we'll leave it at that, that question. And maybe we'll return to the answer. It's not really an answer, an explanation. Because we have to get on with it. It's getting late. We'll finish chapter 9 right now. Not too much of chapter 9 is left. As if I find the text, the old text... <laughs> just a page or so of chapter 9 is left and then we'll leave it at that so this is Lam Rim Chenmo talking about the Buddhist essentialists basically they use that term page 123 essentialist is anyone below Prasanga because each of them have some idea that there is a pointing out reality and that's it and that's that Okay, Prasanga because it says no. There's no Svatantrika just underneath Prasanga it says yes. Uh, ultimately, nothing inherently exists, but conventionally, there's a reason why this is called that. They wipe that out. What's the problem? The mind that wants pointing out reality is the problem. It's not open to the whole panorama. So, there is a huge disparity under the page. Therefore, there is a huge disparity between an essentialist system and a Madhyamaka system with respect to whether things exist either ultimately or conventionally. Again, no, well, he'll repeat it. What they consider conventional existence amounts to ultimate existence from a Madhyamaka perspective, and what they consider ultimately existence exists only conventionally according to the Madhyamaka. The key is they use the same terms but mean different things by it. So as you go through the four schools, you've got to be on your toes. Yeah, it's not inherently existent. Well, no, 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 no. They think inherently existent means this and that. The next school says, no. that is an inherent, you know, on and on. There is nothing contradictory about this, hence you need to draw distinctions. Last chapter, page 124 of Lamrim, volume 3. Furthermore, although the imputedly existent person of these Buddhist essentialists and the imputedly existent person of their master Chandrakirti, Chandrakirti are similar in name, their meanings are not the same. But Chandrakirti maintains that these Buddhist essentialists do not have the view which is the knowledge of the selflessness of the person. This is because he asserts that if you have not known the selflessness of objects, then you cannot have not known the selflessness of the person. Therefore, Chandrakirti asserts that they will continue to apprehend the person as substantially existent as long as they do not give up the tenet that the aggregates are substantially existent. Hence, essentialists do not know that the person does not inherently, ultimately exist. Ultimate and inherent are synonyms in the Prasanga the school. So, chapter 10, we'll go just a few little bit into it from the Lamrim itself, and then we're going to go to right to uh, Geshe Sopa's commentary because it's very rich. He goes off the track and explains a lot of the things you're going to need to study Buddhism, the tenet systems, on your own. So, the title of the chapter is uh, The Object to Be 
negated, misidentifying the object to be negated. Yeah, inherent existent. It means this, that. No, 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 not that, not that. You have to identify what inherent existent is, existence is, before you can find it and throw it out. You know, if I say to someone, uh, who, people that are here, is Obama in the room here? Everyone says, no, we know who Obama is. We know the object of negation. So if I said a Jackie Healy there, some people would know, but some don't. That's her old name. So you have to identify the object that's being negated. That's a silly experience, but anyway, it wakes everybody up. What can I tell you? So, so this chapter, the chapters 10 through 17, will be about identifying the object to be negated by reasoning. Chapters 18 and 21, how to carry out that refutation with a svatantrika procedure or prasangic procedure. How do you go about it between a syllogism or a consequence? That's all. That's later on. We're only on chapter 10. They're talking about chapter 18 already. The coming attractions. <laughs> how to use the procedure to generate the right philosophical within your mind streams, chapters 22 to 24. So he states the overture to the rest of the book that way. And he's saying the parts now we're going to look at, the object has to be carefully identified. And then you refute other systems that refute without identifying the object to be negated. They, they didn't identify what they're supposed to get rid of. They, they goofed. They over-negated or under-negated. Again, negate, negate, negate. Key word. How our system identifies the object of negation. That'll be chapter 17. So, why the object, this is Sankapa talking on page 126, why the object of negation must be carefully identified. He's not talking, he wrote, but anyway. In order to be sure that a certain person is not present, you must know the absent person. Right. Likewise, in order to be certain of the meaning of selflessness or the lack of intrinsic existence, you must carefully identify the self or intrinsic nature. What do they mean by the self? That does not exist. The part of you that does not Now, you're going to do this internally. What do they mean, I don't exist? Or, 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 what part of you was just a fabrication that you're carrying around for billions of years? Really? No wonder I'm tired. Yeah. So, for if you do not have a clear concept of the object to be negated, you will also not have an accurate knowledge of its negation. So what are we going after, in other words? And Shanti Deva says, without contacting the entity that is imputed, you will not apprehend the absence of that entity. You have to know what you're looking for to see that it's not there. There is limitless diversity among objects of negation, but they come together at the root. When you refute this, Sankapai continues, you refute all objects of negation. Moreover, if you leave some remainder, failing to refute the deepest and most subtle core of the object of negation, then you will fall to an extreme of true existence. This is all going on internally with the way you see with the eye. When you see the eye. You will cling to the idea of real things in the external world, whereby you will not be able to escape cyclic existence. Clings or grasp. I have a little note from uh, Rinpoche there. This book is old, so he, he went through it so I can repeat after him. And there's some of his notes there, which are very nice, even though the book's falling apart. And I have a fresh one. This still is the one I quoted. So, if you fail to limit the object of negation and overextend your refutation, you will lose confidence in the causal progressions of dependent arising, thereby falling to a nihilistic extreme. Well, then you didn't identify. Oh, yeah, nothing exists. You were ca casual about the whole thing, cavalier about it. No. There's a level of existence you've got to pay attention to. This nihilistic view will lead you to rebirth in a miserable realm because you'll won't believe in cause and effect anymore. Therefore, it is crucial to identify the object negation of negation carefully, for if it is not identified, you will certainly develop either a nihilistic view or an eternalistic view. And I will check the time to see what we got. A little bit of, now we'll go right to Geshe Sopa. You can't do this whole chapter and then go back to the commentary. You've got to do piece by piece. At least I do, because my brain is, you know, like Swiss cheese or whatever. So... Yeshe Sopa, Lamrim 5. This is identifying the object, to negate, need, the object to be negated. This is Steps on the Path of Enlightenment. His tome, wonderfully translated. I can't bless her enough. The Venerable Deshen Rochard. She's a nun. Friend of Nikki's. Everybody knows Nikki. So, we're on, what page are we on? We're on page 71. The first topic, the word in the first topic, he's talking about the object of to be negated, negated by reasoning. 
In the first topic, the word reasoning does not refer to just any logical thought, any logical thought process, rather. It is a logical investigation that aims to determine whether or not something is truly or ultimately existence. It is ultimate analysis. Remember that term, ultimate analysis, analyzing the ultimate, analyzing the conventional. It is ultimate analysis, a means to arrive at the ultimate truth. The second topic, and that topic is whether to use consequences or syllogisms, um, what type of logical process we should use to cut away the wrong view that things are truly, ultimately, or inherently existence. Should we use consequences, prasanga, or syllogisms, svatantra, to refute the object of negation? And now he explains what they are nicely, precisely. I don't want to sound like a rapper, but nicely and precisely. Oh, anyway, a consequence takes the form such as, if this were the case, then that would be the case. For example, if things were truly existence, existent, then they would arise without a cause. This type of reasoning can refute an opponent's position by showing that what the opponent holds leads to a logically absurd consequence. Reductio ad absurdum, as uh, they use in the, in the Western style. A syllogism takes the form, this must be the case because that is the case. For example, things are not truly existent because they, dependent, they arise dependently on causes. Things are not truly existent. What's the reason? Because they arise dependently on causes. So what's the difference? What's the big deal? The difference between these two logical structures is not simply their form. The important distinction concerns the ontological assumptions, the way they are, the, their mode of being, that they're accepting ontological assumptions on which they are based. A syllogism may be based on the presupposition that things have a certain kind of independent existence in which case it is called an autonomous syllogism. A consequence is never based on such a presupposition. That's why some couple wouldn't argue, because to sit down and use their terms is already to assent to their mode of worldview of how we are. Of the, so you can't do that. You can use syllogisms, but as long as they're not about assuming an ultimate inherent reality. You have to be careful. I wouldn't pick that up. <laughs> I don't know if any of you would, but their minds are so sharp, they do. And it's important because we've got to get rid of this thing. It's an internal problem. It's not something that we can leave alone if we want to. This gets us out of suffering. So therefore, in this section, Sankapa engages in a lengthy discussion about why we should use prasanga or consequences rather than svatantra, uh, autonomous syllogism of reasoning, svatantrika reasoning, to prove the non-existence of the object of negation. The third topic shows how to generate the correct, generate the correct view based on this form of argument. It's how our system identifies. So, let me check the times. So we, have, yes, we have four minutes. So I'll just introduce the topic and we'll run over it again next Monday when we meet. It is most important to correctly identify the object that we are trying to negate. In order to be sure that a certain person is not here, we must know who that person is. If we do not know who it is, we cannot properly understand the statement, he's not here. Likewise, when we say selfless or without inherent nature, we must be able to identify the self or the inherent nature that is being negated. Here we are negating an object as it is held to exist by a mind of ignorance. Boom. It's an object that, that is held to exist by a mind of ignorance. Things and persons do not exist by virtue of their own inherent nature in the way that ignorance holds them to exist. In other words, they are not inherently existent. Boom, boom, boom. That's it. Inherent nature is totally non-existent, so we can negate it by means of valid knowledge. But in order to negate it, we must first we first need to identify it. How can we identify as the object of negation something that does not exist? Yeah, 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 right. To do this, we need to develop a clear general idea of what it would be like if something did in exist inherently or if it were an autonomous self. Once we have clearly identified this general idea of inherent existence, we can understand its absence. If the general idea does not appear clearly to the mind, then we cannot understand its negation. Shantideva says in engaging in the Bodhisattva's deeds, without having identified the imputed thing, you cannot apprehend its essence. So what would it be if there was inherent existence? Okay, if there wasn't inherent existence, nothing, 
to react with each other, there'd be no cause and effect, there'd be, wait a minute, that can't be. But it feels like it. No matter what it feels like. Shut up. Eat your, eat your oatmeal. It, it's important that we bring our mind around to this, because this, this is the most important thing in our lives. So, in this context, the imputed thing, quote, quote, refers to the mental image of the object of negation itself, inherent existence. We have an idea of what it is. A mental image, or an idea, let's make which is superimposed on the thing perceived. That idea influences all oh, that, it's this, this is that. That's a mind of ignorance, throwing out, misreading the reality that is coming in. Nothing but trouble comes from that. Also misreading the thoughts we have. So we can internally we we mis misread. So we cannot Geshe Sobo goes on on page seventy three. Yes. We cannot negate inherent existence unless we recognize this mental image. And we recognize it by developing an understanding of how something would exist if it were to exist inherently. A mental image of inherent existence occurs naturally to most people. Our ordinary self-conscious sense consciousnesses, our ordinary sense consciousnesses perceive everything as inherently existent. It's embedded. There's the problem. It is the way that we, as ordinary beings, experience the world and ourselves. And all this goes into emptiness and all of a sudden comes out of the equipoise and he's seeing the world a little differently. I mean, a lot differently. So this is a big deal. Our ordinary sense consciousness perceive everything as inherently existent. It is the way that we, as ordinary beings, experience the world and ourselves. Based on this mistaken, underlying mistaken perception, our conceptual consciousnesses tend to hold things as inherently existent. We assume that, that's the way it is, and we move the pieces on the board accordingly, throw our ideas around. This is the problem. Such thinking arises naturally, though it may arise in addition owing to philosophical beliefs. That is not as deep as the natural one, as we spoke of before. In any case, as soon as an object appears to the mind, it appears to exist inherently, and a conceptual consciousness will often grasp it to exist as it appears. The object that appears to our minds is merely conventionally imputed, but we do not see it as imputed in this way. We see it as existing from its own side, objectively. We don't see conventional reality. We see inherent existence. Poor boys and girls. We have to readjust. This means that we always see it and frequently conceive of it as inherently existent, existent, which is an additional imputation on top of the conventional thing itself. There's nothing wrong with the conventional thing, but we're laying so much on it. So I'm going to leave it at that because we're already running out of time. Where is my trusty marker? So I know where we left off. And I'll probably start at the top of the chapter again, top of the paragraph. So the next class will be the 9th, right? Monday's the 9th, Saturday 7, 8, yes. Monday the 9th at 7 o'clock. There is no Tara this uh, Saturday. It's a, Non Tara Saturday. Come on, come on. No, no, we're closed. Hi, Bing. How are you? Mrs. Dame Ni. Ni? I'm Lillian Chen. Okay, I hope I pronounced the, rain, the name right. Mrs. Dame Ni. I got uh, so, several people asking me to pray for her. Venerable has said Pope Benedict. Yes, we'll pray for him too. Why not? Sutra of the Recollection of the Noble Three Jewels. Notice how I don't have anything ready. I'm wasting the time. Sorry. I prostrate to the omniscient one. Thus the Buddha, Bhagavata, the Gata, Arahat, Sam, Yak, Sang, Buddha, the learned and virtuous one, the Sugata, the knower of the world, the charioteer and tamer of beings, the unsurpassable one, the teacher of devas and humans is the Buddha, Bhagavat. The Tathagata is in accord with all merit does not waste the roots of virtue. He is completely ornamented with all patience. He is the basis of the treasures of merit. He is adorned with the minor marks. He blossoms with the flowers of the major marks. His activity is timely and appropriate. Seeing him, he is without disharmony. He brings true joy to those who long with faith. His knowledge cannot be overpowered. His strengths cannot be challenged. He is the teacher of all sentient beings. He is the father of bodhisattvas. He is the king of noble ones. He is the guide of those who journey to the city of Nirvana. He possesses immeasurable wisdom. He possesses inconceivable confidence. His speech is completely pure. His melody is pleasing. One never has enough of seeing him. Seeing him, His form is incomparable. He's not stained by the realm of desire. He's not stained by the realm of form. He's not affected by the formless realm. 
He is completely liberated from suffering. He is completely and utterly liberated from the skandhas. He is not possessed with datus as ayatanas are controlled. He has completely cut the knots. He is completely liberated from extreme torment. He is liberated from craving. He has crossed over the river. He is perfected in all the wisdoms. He abides in the wisdom of the Buddha Bhagavats, who arise in the past, present, and future. He does not abide in nirvana. He abides in the ultimate perfection. He dwells on the bumi where he sees all sentient beings. All these are the perfect virtues of the greatness of the Buddha Bhagavat. The Holy Dharma is good at the beginning, good in the middle, and good at the end. Its meaning is excellent. Its words are excellent. It is uncorrupted. It is completely perfect and completely pure. It completely purifies. The Bhagavat teaches the Dharma well. It brings complete vision. It brings a cat, too. So I can't, uh, on top of the text, so I can't. <laughs> it brings complete vision. <laughs> Our stagehand, Eugene, is taking <laughs> He dwells in Bhumi, he sees all sentient. These are the perfect verses of the greatness of the Buddha, Bhagavat. The Holy Dharma is good at the beginning, good at the middle, good at the end. Its meaning is excellent, its words are excellent. It is uncorrupted, it is completely perfect and completely pure. It completely purifies. The Bhagavat teaches the Dharma well. It brings complete vision, it is free from sickness, it is always timely. It directs one further. Seeing it fulfills one's purpose. It brings discriminating insight for the wise. The Dharma, which is taught by the Bhagavat, is, re- not, is revealed properly in the Vinaya. It is renunciation. It causes one to arrive at perfect enlightenment. It is without contradiction. It is pity. It is trustworthy and puts an end to the journey. As for the Sangha of the Great Yana, they enter completely. They enter insightfully. They enter straightforwardly. They enter harmoniously. They are worthy of veneration with joined palms. They are worthy of receiving prostration. They are a field of glorious merit. They are completely capable of receiving all gifts. They are an object of generosity. They are a great object of complete generosity. The protector who possesses great kindness, the omniscient teacher, the basis of oceans of merit and virtue, I prostrate to the Tathagata. Pure the cause of freedom from passion, virtuous, liberating from the lower realms. This alone is the supreme ultimate truth. I prostrate to the Dharma, which is peace. Having been liberated, they show the path to liberation. They are fully dedicated to the disciplines. They are a holy field of merit and possess virtue. I prostrate to the Sangha. I prostrate to the Buddha, the leader. I prostrate to the Dharma, the protector. I prostrate to the Sangha, the community. I prostrate respectfully and always to these three. Well, the cat wanted to prostrate. The Buddha's virtues are inconceivable. The Dharma's virtues are inconceivable. The Sangha's virtues are inconceivable. Having faith in these inconceivables, therefore the fruitions are inconceivable. May they be born in a completely pure realm. Prayer for the flourishing of Jay Sankapa's teachings recommended by His Holiness Dalai Lama as a cause for the swift return of Rato Chimla Rinpoche. Though he's the father producer of all conquerors, the conqueror's son, he produced the thought of upholding the conqueror's dharma in infinite worlds. Through this truth, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Whenever you are in the presence of Buddha Indra Ketu, he made his vow. The conqueror and his offspring praised his powerful courage. Through this truth, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. That the lineage of pure view and conduct might spread, he offered a white crystal rosary to the sage who gave him a conch and prophesied, through this truth, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. His pure view free of eternity or destruction, his pure meditation cleansed of dark fading and fog, his pure conduct practiced according to the conqueror's orders, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Learn, since he extensively sought out learning, reverent, rightly applying it to himself, Good, dedicating all for beings in the doctrine, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Through being sure that all scriptures definitive and interpretive were without contradiction, advice for one person's practice, he stopped all misconduct. May the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Listening to explanations of the three patakas, realized teachings, practice of the three trainings, his skill and accomplished life story is amazing. May the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Outwardly calmed and subdued by the hearer's conduct, inwardly trusting in the two stages practice, he allied without clash the good paths of sutra and tantra. May the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Combining voidness, explained as a causal vehicle with great bliss achieved by method, the effect vehicle. Heart essence of 80,000 dharma bundles. May the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. By the power of the ocean of oath-bound doctrine protectors, like the main guardians of the three beings past, the quick-acting Lord Vaishravana Karmayama, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. In short, by the lasting of glorious Guru's lives, by the earth being full of good, learned, reverend holders of the teaching, and by the increase of power of its patrons, may the conqueror Lozong's teachings flourish. Eight verses on training the mind. With the determination to accomplish the highest welfare of all sentient beings, who surpass even the witch-granting jewel, I will learn to hold them supremely dear. 
Whenever I associate with others, I will learn to think of myself as the lowest amongst all and respectfully hold others to be supreme from the very depths of my heart. In all actions, I will learn to search into my mind. And as soon as a disturbing emotion arises, endangering myself and others, I will firmly face and avert it. I will learn to cherish ill-natured beings and those oppressed by strong misdeeds and sufferings as if I had found the precious treasure difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me badly with abuse, slander, and so on, I will learn to take all loss and offer the victory to them. When the one whom I benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In short, I will learn to offer to everyone without exception all help and happiness directly and indirectly and respectfully take upon myself all harm and suffering of my mothers. I will learn to keep all these practices undefiled by the stains of the eight worldly concerns and by understanding all phenomena as like illusions be released from the bondage of attachment. So that's the end of our session for today. Our next class, as I mentioned before, is January 9th, the class after that, the 11th, and that Saturday will be at Tara, the 14th. So the year moves on and we just got started. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for your patient listening. I know it's a difficult topic, but we'll go through it slowly. It's difficult, but it's necessary. I mean, it is, as His Holiness said. So I hope you enjoyed that Victor Chan text. I did. I don't know. Who cares about you, right? Real my honest. <laughs> anyway, big love to all of you. Thank you for your patient listening.